Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night. Hello, everyone. My name is Lauren, um, and I am the Educator Community Manager at Empatico, which is a free platform for educators to connect with classrooms around the world through virtual exchanges and that ultimately builds students' empathy. Um, I'm super, super excited to be here with you all today for our session, Crossing the Cultural Exchange. And thank you again um, to the Macmillan team for having me today. First things first, here is a quick overview of what I will be sharing today and kind of exploring with you all. First, we'll talk a little bit about cross-cultural communication and why we think it's especially important for students to practice today. Uh, then I wanna talk a bit about empathy, which is core to Empatico's mission and how empathy relates to cross-cultural exchanges. We'll dive into a framework that we use at Empatico to help us think more deeply about empathy, including nine empathy-related skills. And then I'll share some specific tips for practicing those skills, especially through cross-cultural communication and exchanges that you all can go off and use immediately in the classroom with your students. So to start, cross-cultural communication. Why is it important? What is it and why is it important? Cross-cultural communication or intercultural communication is defined as communication between participants from different cultures. Not only can vocabulary be different, but communication styles, ways to address the other person that you're speaking with, and even norms regarding taking turns in a conversation can all differ depending on cultural norms. It's also important to remember that culture is active and changes as we experience, and effective cross-cultural communication does require reflection. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, many were already talking about the benefits and importance of cross-cultural communication in a world with increasing opportunities to meet others from diverse backgrounds and perspectives in social settings, business settings, et cetera. But in the COVID-19 pandemic, um, I think that further highlighted the actual need for cross-cultural communication. With the pandemic, we've seen an amplification of social inequalities and vulnerabilities, a rise of xenophobia and ethnocultural racism, a rise in gender-based violence and rising discrimination against non-citizens. Educators specifically have seen heightened feelings of being misunderstood, isolation and abandonment, anxiety and depression amongst our students. And we're all seeing educators leaving the profession due to teacher burnout at rates that we haven't seen historically before. Um, and you know, here today we're talking about cross-cultural communication. And while cross-cultural communication will not solve these issues that we have seen, Developing those cross-cultural communication skills creates a space to address them from a place of inclusion, empowerment, and respect for all. And we at Empatico believe that empathy is the base of cross-cultural communication. Um, for any Spanish speakers out there, empatico, empathy, it all rolls right in there together. So what is empathy? Let's talk a little bit about empathy first, just to get started. It is, it feels like it's become such a buzzword right now, but what exactly is empathy? Everyone's definition of empathy might be a little bit different. Um, so we're gonna do a brief warm up together so we can start bringing some shape to our collective understanding of this concept of empathy. Um, I want everybody to take a couple seconds and consider this essential question. What are a few words that you associate with empathy? Go ahead and enter your words into the chat. You can answer any of these questions here. We've got, what does empathy mean to you? What words do you associate with empathy? What does empathy look like? And what does empathy feel like when you think about empathy? I see caring, support, contact, compassion, understanding, placing yourself in someone else's shoes. These are all great. And I'm seeing quite a few connections amongst everybody. We've got caring, support, putting yourself in somebody else's shoes, respect, being seen, seeing someone else. That sounds like we all have a, a very similar idea and a very similar feeling that comes to mind when we think about empathy, tolerance, care for others. Awesome. Thank you all for sharing those words that come to mind when you think about empathy. It's really cool to see that, you know, we, we already mentioned that we've got so many people from all over the world here today joining us. And it's awesome to see that that word, that concept of empathy, we have very, very similar ideas no matter where we are. You know, it's that idea of caring, support, putting ourselves in other's shoes. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and in recent years, researchers have landed on something like this definition. 
Empathy is a multidimensional phenomenon that allows us to feel what others are feeling, understand what others think and feel, and acting on those feelings and understandings. Um, empathy can decrease prejudice and bias. It can reduce conflict, bullying, and school violence. It fosters a sense of purpose to help others. It helps to identify one's own emotions and those of others. And it promotes positive relationships, which ties directly into building those cross-cultural communication skills, which is what we're here to talk about today. Now let's dig a little bit deeper into how we define empathy. Um, I've got a quote here that really, really speaks to us at Empatico about empathy and kind of encompasses those ideas or that idea of empathy. Empathy is produced not only by how we perceive information, but also how we understand that information. So cognitive empathy, are moved by it, emotional empathy, and use it to motivate our behavior, behavioral empathy. As the research literature in education, psychology, sociology, conflict resolution, and communication demonstrates, empathy is a multidimensional phenomenon. It actually encompasses three distinct domains. We have the emotional, feeling what others feel. We saw that in the chat there. The cognitive, understanding what others think and feel. We also saw that in the chat and the behavioral, acting on those feelings and understandings. These three domains illustrate a whole child or a whole student or a whole person approach to social learning. Then within those three domains, empathy research highlights three levels of application or interaction. We have the inter intrapersonal, the self and empathetic relationship with oneself, the interpersonal, um, individual others or an individual's relationship with other individuals and the intergroup um, or an individual's relationship with collectives or groups of people who are different from one's own group. Um, I wanna come back to these three domains of empathy and three levels of interaction. But first, before we do that, I wanna go a little bit deeper into the intergroup interactions and how that ties into cross-cultural communication. We've got the intergroup, excuse me, the intergroup empathy gap is what I wanna focus on really quickly before we move forward. When talking about empathy in the context of cross-cultural communication, it's really important to remember the intergroup empathy gap. Um, while it might be easier to demonstrate empathy towards people who we think are similar to us or people who we trust um, or are in group, it can be more challenging to demonstrate empathy towards people who we think are different from us or our out group, that us, them. This drives what researchers call the intergroup empathy gap, which can lead to division and increased prejudice and bias towards members of different identity groups. We're probably all familiar with this experience, seeing the divides in the world today across political, racial, ethnic, and geographic lines even digital and social media tools um, that were created to connect us, they were initially created to connect us, they can actually lead to disconnection and create this empathy gap or further this empathy gap. These tools can also reinforce stereotypes and keep us refined in our bubbles if we're not careful and conscious. So the need to bridge this inner group empathy gap directly ties into the need to develop cross-cultural communication skills um, we at Empatico are actively working to help close that intergroup empathy gap, and we've developed what we call an empathy framework to help students build empathy and support those cross-cultural communication skills. To break this down, to break empathy down um, and get really specific about how we and our students can become more well-rounded, empathetic individuals, we've developed what we're calling an empathy framework, which you'll see here on the screen right now. Um, you'll see this three by three grid, the three dimensions of empathy are in there, the emotional, cognitive, and behavioral, and the three rings demonstrating the levels of interaction, the intrapersonal, the interpersonal, and the intergroup. You can see here that there are nine key skills in total to practice in order to build empathy amongst our students. And all of these skills combined allow us to connect with others, develop a deeper understanding of ourselves, others, and the world, and act with compassion, which are all necessary for cross-cultural communication. Let's take a look more closely at emotional empathy or feeling what others feel. Um, again, this was one that I think a lot of us, this came to mind when we were talking about empathy in the chat. Um, we have at the intrapersonal level, we have mindfulness or the ability to maintain a moment to moment awareness of our own thoughts and feelings. Mindfulness promotes emotional well-being and can improve one's own mental and emotional health, 
making it possible to better connect with and help others. At the interpersonal level, emotion recognition means recognizing the mood, feelings, or emotions of another person, which is a crucial prerequisite for being able to show an appropriate emotional response to support or help others. Again, that idea of supporting, connecting, and helping others. And then finally, at the intergroup level, diplomacy also helps us be more aware of others' emotions and helps us regulate and manage our emotions, but especially as we're interacting with those who have different backgrounds, perspectives, or experiences from our own. Um, when we think about diplomacy, diplomacy is more about being open to others' emotions and recognizing or managing those emotions especially in intercultural intergroup settings. And when I say manage, I mean um, like navigate, not necessarily control, but navigate those emotions. Next, let's look more closely at cognitive empathy um, or understanding what others think. At the intrapersonal level, there at the kind of the inner circle, we have self-awareness. Um, and self-awareness is similar to mindfulness but more about the ability to understand our own thoughts and values and how they influence our behaviors in different contexts. Self-awareness is a foundational skill for other empathy-related skills. And in fact, recent studies have shown that the more self-aware children are, the greater their perspective taking skills. Next in that kind of middle, middle circle area at the interpersonal level, we have perspective taking or imagining the thoughts and experiences of another person. It might be how a lot of us define and think about empathy. Um, we definitely saw a little bit of that in the chat there. And it's a skill that can be trained and reinforced throughout one's own life. Um, you know, and that's especially why it's important to start with our youngest students, but to also continue practicing this um, for all of us as we, <laughs> as we get older and navigate this world. And then in that outer circle at the inner group level, we take this idea a step further by practicing inclusivity or recognizing members of different groups as humans who have diverse perspectives and who are worthy of our empathy. Inclusivity is about proactively including other groups um, and their perspectives. And finally, let's look more closely at behavioral empathy um, or taking action to help others. Recent research has shown that behavioral empathy has its own motivations distinct from cognitive and emotional empathy, and that's a basic desire to help or protect nearby others as well as oneself and one's community. Then let's take a look at that kind of inner circle again. At the intrapersonal level, self-care is a foundational skill as we need to take time to care for others in, excuse me, for ourselves <laughs> in order to have the capacity and energy to reach out and help others. That's a good reminder that again, we always need to take care of ourselves in order to be able to extend and help others. Um, think about that metaphor of, you know, when you're, when you're on a plane and they tell you if that oxygen mask comes down to put your own oxygen mask on first before putting on the person, the person that's next to you before putting on their oxygen mask. That's this idea here, you know, making sure that you're taking care of yourself first in order to um, take care of others after that. At the interpersonal level, kindness is all about helping others. Kindness can be most effective in combination with emotional and cognitive empathy, as knowing what others need and feeling their distress can motivate our own kind behaviors. Research also demonstrates that being kind towards others can lead to better and stronger mental and physical health, relationships, and life satisfaction, um, all great benefits. <laughs> And then finally, at the intergroup level, collaboration extends our kindness and willingness to help not only those in our own social group, but members of other groups as well. Collaboration is a key, key part of empathy as it involves working with others to make a positive difference in the world. Collaboration can also involve related skills like respectful communication, active and compassionate listening, conflict, conflict resolution, and problem solving. Now let's take a look at what does this look like in practice? What does practicing these skills look like in practice? How can we work on building these skills to build empathy amongst our students to make cross-cultural exchanges enriching for all of those involved? That's why we're here today to talk about this. What are some things that we can do to help students build these skills? 
So to foster emotional empathy, the key skills we want to build are mindfulness, emotion recognition, and diplomacy. Those were those different areas in that in the inner, the middle space, and the outer circle. To build mindfulness, um, as educators, we can nurture positive feelings about a cross-cultural experience like excitement and curiosity. If students are feeling nervous about the exchange, research shows that about any type of virtual exchange, or you know, even if you're in your classroom um, and you have an in-person exchange with different students, research shows that an imagination conversation or encouraging students to take a few minutes to imagine a positive, friendly, cross-cultural experience can help calm those nerves and lead to more productive exchanges or interactions. Mindfulness skills can be reinforced in the classroom through mindful meditations, through movement, through breathing, or even journaling at the beginning of the school day or between lessons to give students a quick brain break. Um, and also all of those journaling, all of those are great ways to practice um, language development as well. Next, uh, to build emotion recognition, encouraging students to take time to observe, recognize, and honor the mood, feelings, or emotions of their peers during a cross-cultural exchange will really help to build that emotion recognition. Um, you can, as educators, you can also model this skill in your own classroom by recognizing, naming, and acknowledging students' emotions day to day. And on that note, research shows that adults like educators play a primary role in helping students develop empathy by serving as empathy role models for all of these nine skills that we're discussing today. Then to build diplomacy skills, encourage students to be sensitive to different opinions, beliefs, feelings, norms, and ideas across cultures. When engaged in cross-cultural communication, encourage students to remain open to differences encourage, or excuse me, recognize those nuances and those differences and to show kindness and tact in their communication. For example, if students feel negatively or have a negative reaction to something their peers share, help them reframe those negative emotions with kindness and curiosity by asking questions and making, I wonder, comments. Um, I think often we think about diplomacy in kind of the political context and in the international relations context. But if you think about diplomacy, it really is kind of navigating um, those relationships between people. And it can happen at an international level, you know, a political level, but it can also happen on a much more individual level in our cross-cultural communication spaces. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, next up, cognitive empathy. As a reminder to foster cognitive empathy, we wanna build self-awareness, perspective taking and inclusivity. To build self-awareness, help students explore and reflect on their own identities, such as their family backgrounds, cultural traditions, hobbies, and more, and then consider what makes them unique. Help them consider what their own background and experiences may lead them to have different opinions or viewpoints from their peers. And one way to do this is by having students create cultural identity trees where different parts of the tree represent um, students' major accomplishments, hopes and dreams, strengths, values, and other aspects of their identity. <coughs> Excuse me. Finally, in cross-cultural exchanges, encourage students to share their personal stories with each other, which can help build trust and mutual understanding. They might even share something like a cultural identity tree with each other. And again, thinking about this also in the context of um, a language learning classroom, these are all great ways to practice learning that language as well. Excuse me, I need a sip of water for one second. Thank you. Um, next step to build perspective taking, encourage students to seek others' experiences when engaging in cross-cultural dialogue, especially in the context of problem solving. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's say that your class is working on a project exploring ways to address community challenges, it's important for students to explore, <coughs> excuse me, how different people are affected by the same issue. Prompt them to reflect on what, what might limit their understanding of how others experience a particular challenge and what they can do to incorporate those perspectives into that problem solving process. And ask students to think about why peers may have a different point of view and help them learn to appreciate those differences encourage students to ask questions rather than make assumptions about how others feel or think and why, 
And one simple way to have students practice perspective taking day to day in your classroom is during reading activities where you can prompt students to consider a character's thoughts and feelings or how a character might act next based on what they know about the character's background and experiences. And again, these are all great ways to practice language learning as well. Um, and that can be incorporated into a language learning classroom. Finally, to build inclusivity, encourage students to see how all human beings in the world have inherent worth with strength to share and opportunities to grow. Frame cross-cultural exchanges as opportunities to learn from and with one another, rather than seeing their partners as subjects or topics to learn about. Remind students of their common humanity to decrease any power language that may be showing up, anything showing that they feel inferior or superior um, to their partners. Avoid, try and avoid comparisons like we are better or more fortunate, which actually hinder empathy in the long run and motivate students to learn about other strengths. And finally, um, to foster behavioral empathy, we wanna build self-care, kindness, and collaboration. To build self-care skills, encourage students to practice self-compassion during these cross-cultural activities. Remind them that bridging differences is something that takes a lifetime of practice and that it's important to be kind to yourself when you are learning and trying something new. Encourage students to see how all human beings in the world, including themselves, have inherent worth with strengths to share and opportunities to grow. And this is also a great area to really model that for students, practice it for yourself, and then also continue to encourage your students to build um, those self-care skills. To build kindness, discuss, model, and celebrate respectful communication and behavior norms. Encourage students to think about how the differences they discover can be things their peers celebrate about themselves and to show kindness when they talk about them, kindness and curiosity. For example, you might ask, how would you like people to acknowledge you when you are different from them? How can you show kindness towards someone who is different from you? Can you think of a time when someone was kind to you? As a facilitator of cross-cultural exchanges, you can also actively observe, identify, and celebrate student behaviors and show respect and other strengths like empathy, thoughtfulness, and humility. For example, express gratitude to your students when they actively listen and thoughtfully respond to each other during a conversation point it out to them, express, express that gratitude to them. That's a big part of celebrating, discussing it, modeling it and celebrating, um, practicing that kindness skill. And then to build collaboration skills, challenge students to find ways to use their differences to better their communities and the world. How can differences become strengths in their collaboration and empower the whole group? One simple way to introduce and reinforce collaboration in the classroom is to read stories that emphasize teamwork and how cooperating is better than competing with each other. Another way is to help students assign roles in group projects. For example, students might share their strengths and weaknesses with each other. Excuse me. <clears throat> then consider roles like a facilitator who makes sure everyone does their part, a liaison who communicates with the educators, a team tutor who makes sure the group understands the topic in any relevant context, and the recorder who records and organizes the group's work. In this way, collaboration can foster deeper connections among students and lead to better and more creative problem solving. And again, these are all skills that and, and practices that can be weaved into a language learning classroom. It's a great way to practice language to put students and have them in these roles um, and in different roles, you know, if you're the recorder, you're practicing writing skills. Um, if you are the liaison, you're practicing verbal communication and also active listening in that language. So these are all um, practices that can be built into a language learning classroom um, and into cross-cultural exchanges as well. Uh, to wrap up at Empatico, we incorporate these nine skills on our platform by supporting live video conversations between classrooms and asynchronous collaborative cross classroom projects. We provide simple lesson plans to help structure these exchanges and reinforce all of these nine skills in the framework that you see up here on the screen again. Um, this is actually, it's a little bit earlier than expected. I went a little bit faster. I apologize, Joel, but this is a great moment to bring Joel back in to talk about how we're working together on these cultural exchanges through the Macmillan Virtual Classroom Exchange. And I will say one final thank you. I'm still here, but I'll kind of <laughs> let Joel take over. 
one final thank you for for having me today and letting me speak thank you lauren thank you and i think you can now take a big gulp of water <laughs> that, that cough just wouldn't leave you alone the whole time thank you i know it just of course it happens to like i have no cough <laughs> the rest of the week and this morning right now <laughs> uh, but it was brilliant it was it was it was a fantastic talk thank you and i think the the idea of, of empathy is so important and and i mentioned earlier to travis and i think it's you know so important to highlight that i don't know if there's ever been a time where empathy has felt like a more important skill to to foster i um, maybe it's part of growing up you start to see the world as being ever more divisive or maybe it's a unique point in time that we're living in the world but mm -hmm. i think i think the more we can foster those skills within within our students it's it's really important particularly in 2023. Yeah, and the importance of modeling them too, not only like fostering them within our students, but also practicing them ourselves. I completely agree. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm just going to have a quick look in the Q&A, Lauren, to see if anyone had any questions. Yeah. Um, it doesn't look like there's anything that Will hasn't already addressed or, or answered. If you do have any questions, feel free to drop them in the in the Q and A, and 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 I'll answer them. But um, but that was that was that was great, Lauren. And I will I will take over now because I think um, this nicely leads on to what I want to talk about. And like Lauren said, the work that we're doing at Midland Education and uh, with uh, the team at Impatico. I'm going to talk to you today about um, about Gateway to the World and our virtual classroom exchange, which we're delivering in partnership with with Impatico. And, and the title of the talk today was about crossing the cultural exchange. I like to think of culture almost um, like an iceberg. And apart from being very nice to photograph and being quite dangerous to boats, um, culture is, is, is like an iceberg in the sense that most of it sits below the water. And, and lots of what we see in culture is just that top 10%, which we often talk about. Food and clothing and dance, arts and music. These are the things that we often um, know about other cultures and are exposed to about other cultures. But what is often below the surface that we don't see are things like the relationships and roles in a culture, the beliefs and values in the culture and the attitudes and norms in the culture. I can see people in in the chat here from all over the world i've seen georgia czech republic i've seen mexico argentina all of us are, have a unique culture and all of us have a unique perspective and thing to say about our culture and if you think about your students uh, you know think about what would they want to share about their culture if they had the chance and lauren presented loads of practical tips for 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 how um, we can foster empathy through through virtual classroom exchanges and i want to talk um more about some some of the more practical impl implementations and the how we can we can implement those skills of cross-cultural awareness intercultural communication developing a positive open-minded attitude and critical and creative thinking amongst our students interacting with these learners worldwide with other classrooms will really help the students develop all of those skills that we mentioned. And it also helps students break traditionally held views of other cultures, but maybe their own as well. It helps them discover different, different points of view on, on their culture and that, that area of the iceberg that sits below the surface. Traditionally, I think in, in, in teaching materials of the past, we've been very focused on that top 10% of what food is eaten around the world, what dances are performed around the world. I think these virtual exchanges can really help us discover a bit more below the surface. And, and, and I can say from my own personal experience of, of living in another country, it's when you start to explore and experience that 90% that sits below the water that you can really feel like you're, you're, you can get to know people on a, on a deeper level and create deeper connections with people, which obviously from a language learning point of view is incredibly, incredibly powerful in terms of the conversations you can have and, and the relationships you can establish. The other positive of, of, of facilitating and creating these exchanges on a virtual level with classrooms around the world is we can really 
open this up to every student, no matter where they sit on a socioeconomic scale. These sorts of exchanges are something that has always been done in a sense, uh, but not virtually. Often in the past, schools would do exchange programs with other schools, but this might have been reserved for students whose parents were able to pay for them to go and visit another country for a week. Through a virtual exchange, we can make this available to absolutely every student in, in our class. And I think that's a really, really, really powerful tool. This also helps strengthen students' life skills. And those of you who, who, who are familiar with, with Gateway know that life skills has always been a, been a core idea of the course. Um, and, and it really does have so many benefits above and beyond these skills and the empathy skills that Lauren talked about earlier. So how can you begin to implement these practices in your classroom? You've heard today about all of the benefits, but how can you, how can you get started? Well, as I mentioned, um, at Macmillan Education, we've partnered with Empatico to create a unique community of, of, of uh, classrooms, of secondary classes around the world and facilitate their connections um, to create these exchanges. And we'll look, about, uh, we'll look at how that's done um, shortly. Through the Gateway to the World course, we have a number of resources, units and projects, collaborative projects, and, and Lauren talked a lot about collaboration in, in her empathy framework. We, these collaborative projects occur every second unit in Gateway to the World, and these offer students the framework to create a, an output for these virtual exchanges that the virtual classroom exchange facilitates. In 2021, we did a survey with uh, with secondary teachers and more than half of them told us that encouraging communication uh, in English between their students was one of their biggest challenges. The virtual classroom exchange really helps with that because it gives students a real meaningful and, and, and tangible reason for communication with their, with their partner class. So we bring together classes from different cultures to, to facilitate the, the presentation and the exchanging of ideas and the exchanging of, of their collaborative project outputs. So this all sounds very exciting, um, but I'm sure you're asking how you get started. It's really, really simple. There's a very, very simple sign up process to register your class, where you simply need to tell us about your student's age, the interests and the topic areas that matter to your class. You tell us where your school is and, and the time zones your, your school sits in. And you let us know what days of the week you, you tend to have your class, whether they're in the early morning, late morning, early afternoon or the late afternoon. And that's really it. Once you provide us with those details and you add those details to the platform, you're part of an educator community. You are part of the virtual classroom exchange community. You can see here an example of all of the classes that you can connect with, and you can connect with as many classes as you want. You'll see examples here of classes in the United States, in Turkey, in Great Britain, but we have classes uh, already registered from every single corner of the world. It really is up to you who you'd like to exchange with, and you can create as many connections as you wish. You can send requests to connect with your partner class. You can check where their schedule overlaps with yours so that you can check you have classes at the same time. And you'll, you can see them as part of your, of your community, of your connections. You can send your partner teacher messages and you can schedule a meeting on whatever platform you're already using, whether it be Zoom, Google Meets, Microsoft Teams. Your calendars will sync with your partner class so you can see when you have the overlapping time. And this is really a tool that just makes these virtual classroom exchanges that we've heard all the benefits about so, so, so very simple. At every step of the way, you'll receive messages and updates about any exchanges, any messages you've received, any invites from other partner classes, and you'll always be contacted um, and kept up to date with how your exchange is going. Once, once you've done all that, you are ready to explore the world with your class. You're ready to start performing the exchanges. And you can do as many as you want or as few as you want. It might be something you want to do once a year, once a term. It might be something that your students ask to do more often because, as we say, the benefits are, are, are real with a virtual classroom exchange 
uh, and those skills that students can develop are so, so, so important. We really believe that once your students have completed one exchange, they'll want to do more and more and you can connect with classes from different parts of the world. It might sound uh, overwhelming, but don't worry, there is plenty of support available at all times. We have a dedicated support email address for the virtual classroom exchange. So any technical support you might need, your, your, your is a, uh, support is available at all times. The Teachers Resource Centre with Gateway to the World is full of resources to enhance and facilitate your, your teacher exchange. And it includes a detailed teacher's guide um, on how to get the most out of your virtual exchange, including some of the some of the hints and tips that, that Lauren mentioned today on, on, on fostering that empathy. And you can even access the Virtual Classroom Exchange directly from the Macmillan Education Teachers app. That's a very quick overview of, of, of this simple way to sign your class up and register for the Virtual Classroom Exchange if you're a Gateway to the World user. If you want to learn more about Gateway to the World and the Virtual Classroom Exchange, please visit macmillanenglish.com forward slash gateway to the world. And hopefully the, the link will be dropped in the chat as we speak. If your students are already using Gateway to the World and you'd like to sign your class up for the Virtual Classroom Exchange, you can go straight to macmillanenglish.com forward slash BCE, pop in those few class details and you'll be ready to start exchanging. If you want further information, um, Will or or, or somebody will drop in the chat shortly, a link to contact your local representative, whoever's in your area, in your country, in your region, who will be able to give you any further information you might wish. So the Virtual Classroom Exchange and Gateway to the World is a tool we have created at Millen Education in partnership with Empatico to help you as teachers connect your classes to other classes around the world and to start fostering and, 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 in, and creating those intercultural communication skills. Um, and I think that's, that's it from me. Um, if there's any questions, I will get to them in the Q&A, or Will, I'm sure, will tell me any that I might have missed. Thank you very much. You Thanks, Lauren, as well. Thanks, both of you. What an amazing talk, set of talks. Thank you very much for putting it all together. Really, really interesting stuff. I think we need to thank Lauren most because she was up at six o'clock in the morning. It's a far more sociable hour for me. <laughs> no, no, I think, Lauren, you, you can't have been up at six. You started speaking at six o'clock. I, I was yeah. up earlier, but again, time is invented. We're not thinking about that. You actually, you know, <laughs> it's getting sunny outside right now. <laughs> Still another four months till we see the sun in, the, in London, I'm sure. So. Yeah. <laughs> So we've, we've got a couple of questions, actually. So uh, the first one is Great. from Maria. Um, a question for either of you. Uh, can you recommend any books about this topic? So oh, um, I'll, I'll go, Lauren. I mean, <laughs> if, you're talk, if, if you're talking about uh, resources, Maria, to implement this in your class, I can't recommend highly enough Gateway to the World. But if you're talking more about um, any academic texts on intercultural communication. I will have to defer there to you, Lauren. I don't know if you've got any recommendations. So I'm actually going to take it in a different direction. Um, I think there's, you know, there's a lot of academic texts on this. Um, and I, you, you know, we're all in the education field. We're lifelong learners. We know that we can read and learn and kind of um, expose ourselves to a lot of this information. But a big part of learning is actually like sitting with it and digesting it. So I'm actually going to recommend like exploring the world of fiction to really practice these skills. As we talked about in, in the presentation, this idea of perspective taking um, with characters. So this could be used with younger students, with older students, with yourselves. Um, really like sitting with a fiction book and thinking about those characters, putting yourself in their perspective. I think that's a great way to practice this um, and to really work on kind of implementing it in your own life and implementing it with your students. I love that idea. That's great. That's a really interesting answer. Thanks, Lauren. Yeah. Um, so we've had um, a couple of questions, Joel, on um, LinkedIn about mm -hmm. uh, the virtual classroom exchange. So a question from somebody who is a professional independent teacher with students. Um, they're asking if they can do it as an independent teacher and is there an extra charge for students to use the platform? 
if if students are using the gateway to the world course book there's no there's no extra charge for using the virtual classroom exchange it's 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 part of the course it's it's in, you know it's available to all teachers using the gateway to the world course book the idea is that the students uh go through the unit and gain the language and 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 the knowledge to be able to do the collaborative projects which appear every second unit in gateway to the world and that's their their framework project output for the virtual classroom exchange so no there's no there's no extra charge but it's important that the students um have have the the material to be able to to build up to those collaborative projects okay um okay question from again from someone on uh, facebook can you recommend uh, any kind of warm up activity, uh, a game, they said game, or any kind of warm up activity um, that you can recommend that, student, that teachers do with their students to warm up a class, to do at the beginning, a quick thing at the beginning that they can do to raise their uh, skills of empathy? Uh, one of my favorite ones, um, I, I know it as one word whip. That's the name of this game that I've always learned it as. Um, but it's really starting again. We've talked about really checking in with yourself first and being able to name like the emotions that you're feeling, all of that. And what one word whip is, it's a quick check-in with whatever group that you're with. Um, and you just go around and you say one word that describes how you're feeling in that moment. Um, and it's a great way to practice that self-reflection for your students and to also hear how others are feeling around them. Um, and so that they can see, you know, maybe they're feeling very similar, similarly to another student, or maybe they're feeling very differently to another student. And it's a good reminder that um, we are all living lives at the exact same time and interacting with each other and going through different things at the same time as we're interacting with each other. And I think that is one of my absolute, absolute favorite warmups that just gets you in a space of like, this is how I'm feeling. This is how other feel, uh, others are feeling. Now let's move forward, recognizing that. That's great. Yeah. That's, a, that's a great one. It's very nice. Thanks a lot, Lauren. Yeah. Um, another one, I think for you, Lauren, um, question from Sean. Um, it's got it's kind of two questions so the first one is how to detect as a teacher um that well how to minimize bullying they're talking about sort of bullying due to cultural differences um i'm sure you could probably deliver a, a weekend of training on this but <laughs> you yeah. do it in about five words <laughs> in, in five words in one word we talked about one word whip let's do <laughs> <let's laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. one word um, wow, that is a very complicated um, question. I think one space is to really be proactive with building these empathy skills um, and get students thinking from the beginning, get students thinking about their own emotions and thinking about others' emotions from the start, because then that will also help once conflict arises. You know, we all know that conflict is a part of life um, and that, I mean, conflict and, and bullying are two separate things and not equating them to each other, um, but conflict does arise. And I think if we are proactively building those skills of being able to put yourself in another's shoes, when we come into those spaces of um, conflict or bullying in this case, uh, you're not starting from scratch when you're working to address the situation that's happening. Um, you've got some skills that you can work with and build on of, okay, stepping back and saying, hey, this is a situation that has affected another student. Let's talk this through. How did this make this other student feel? And then working from there. Um, so it, I guess in one word, being proactive with building these empathy skills. That was more than one word, but pretend I hyphenated it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, um, and the second part of that question, from the same person, thanks for these questions, Sean, these really interesting questions. Um, the second one is, um, so during your talk, Lauren, you were talking about what empathy is and how you can address it in class. Mm -hmm. And Sean wants to know how to sort of bridge the gap between a teacher giving them that information and, uh, and then the next, and taking it to the next stage of giving them opportunities and skills and ways of internalizing the essence, as Sean's put it, internalizing the essence of empathy so that it's not just a mere lecture from a teacher. 
That, yeah, that's a great question because that is a risk that you run. You know, you don't want it just to be a lecture and, and um, that the lesson isn't actually being learned. I think reflection is a big part of that and being intentional about creating space to reflect. Um, and so this could be, you know, we talked about journaling um, and using journaling to recognize your own emotions. And again, that could be a great way we're talking about language practice. That's a great space to practice language. Um, but then also, even if you think about other activities, if you're doing like a skit or something in class, that's a, a common activity that happens in a language learning class. If you do a skit, taking some time afterwards to reflect on what happened in that skit. We had multiple people, they were feeling different things. This action happened and these different people felt different things after that action happened and really allowing your students to not only ref reflect on their own, but also giving them a space to reflect together because that's also a part of learning. You know, we don't learn in isolation. We don't learn, um, it's kind of like what we talked about with that last question of like, we can read, we can hear all these things, but in order to really learn something, we have to practice it not only on our own, but with others. Um, so I think, again, this is another question that could have a whole nother webinar um, topic, but being intentional about creating a space to reflect, I think is very, very important um, in the process of not just like lecturing at students, but actually ensuring that they're internalizing those lessons. Thanks, Lauren. And I think a lot of the teachers here are English language teachers, if not all. I think most teachers that are here teach English as a, as a, as a second or other or foreign language. Mm -hmm. um, what role does language have to play in those conversations? Do you think it's imperative that they use English or do you think there's room for flexibility there? I, I mean, I'm going to say I understand that we are in a space of with a majority of um, English language teachers. I think there is plenty of flexibility there. Um, I, you know, language in and of itself is fluid um, and constantly changing. And, and we see that with I'll say, um, I'll speak from personal experience. Uh, so I'm in Los Angeles, California, in the United States, very, very, very diverse city. Um, the English that I speak has so many other languages thrown in there. Like I, you, I don't say flip-flops, I say chanclas, I say chancletas. I've said that since I was born. Like, <laughs> you know, there is space and, and incorporating and recognizing that language is, fluid helps with that perspective taking you know this is when I use that word it's it's a recognition and a respect of other languages and other perspectives as well um, and I, I do think that language plays a big role in this and the fluidity of language also plays a huge role in building empathy completely agree thanks Lauren um, absolutely Joel, a question for you on the, on, the, on, the, on the virtual classroom exchange. How do teachers find partner classes? So partner classes, uh, teachers are able to select their partner class. They're presented with a selection of classes based on uh, the times they've said their classes are, the interests that they've marked as being important to, to their class. So the class that they partner with or classes is really up to the teacher and they can explore all of those as part of the community on, on, on the Empatico platform. Um, so my suggestion to answer that question is, is head to mcmillanenglish.com forward slash gateway to the world. Look at all of the information about the virtual classroom exchange and you'll be able to see um, how the process works and how you can, how you can select your, your partner class or how your partner class can select you. Thank you.